The following is a retelling of the events that occurred in the lifetime of one Jean-Louis de Belleville, later Jean de Clisson, in the early half of the 14th century. When we think of pirates, our minds usually drift to the Caribbean. We think of names like Captain Blackbeard and Captain Kidd, Bartholomew Roberts, Henry Avery, and Bonnie, Guybrush Reap. And while we might associate names like Nassau or Tortuga with these pirates, their heyday was in what was known as the Golden Age of Piracy, which lasted between the years 1650 through to around the late 1720s. Let me take you a bit further back than that, 14th century to be exact. You know that northwestern tip of France, that peninsula that sticks out into the Atlantic on the northern end of the Bay of Biscay? That's Brittany, what the French call Bretagne. That name sounds kind of like Britain when you think about it. Coincidence? Not at all. Used to be Brittany was called Little Britain. You know, in contrast to Great Britain. It was even a sovereign independent state. Hey, you take it easy when you talk to me, okay? Yeah, that's right. I'm fucking okay. Now leave me the fuck alone. Used to be a hot spot for trouble way back when. The English and the French had a war on for it. Went on for quite some time. You've probably heard of the period. Historians called it the Hundred Years' War. The, the, the Hundred Years' War, in short, was a whole slew of conflicts between the French noble houses Valois and Plantagenet. It was during this era in history you had events like the Grey Famine, the Battle of Crecy, the Battle of Agincourt, Joan of Arc, the Bubonic Plague, and so on. Historians note the Hundred Years' War to have lasted between the years 1337 and 1453. For the purpose of our story, we're going back a bit further, to 1300 and double law, the very start of the 14th century. I had control. I was just thinking about joining the army. You know, see the world, meet interesting people and kill them. What do you say? And the start of our story as well as the birth of Jean-Louis de Belleville and belleville sur -Ville. Born into a noble house, her parents were Maurice Montagu and Letice de Partenay. Jean-Louis was married off at the astoundingly young age of 12 to a man seven years her senior named Geoffrey de Chateaubriand, the eighth. As you maybe could have guessed, he was also a nobleman. At the age of 14 in the year 1314, Jean-Louis gave birth to their son, Geoffrey. Geoffrey de Chateaubriand the Ninth. Original, I know. In 1316, they had a daughter, Louise. Then Geoffrey died, at the ripe old age of 33. Geoffrey the Ninth took over his father's estate at the age of 14. Two years after Geoffrey's passing, Jean-Louis, now 28, remarried. No reason to be so edgy, Control. Everything is fine over here. Go! 
Okay, hey, control. There seems to be a fire here. Oh, wait a minute. No, hang on. No fire. I'm just hallucinating because I'm so fucking bo- Got a body bag case here. This time to a man named Guy de Pontier. Not much is known about this time in John Lewis's life. Most sources seem to agree on the fact that the marriage was not a happy one. No children came of the wedlock, and after only two years, in 1330, their marriage was annulled by Pope John the Twenty Second. Two points of interest about the politics going on at this time. 1. In 1303, the then King of France, Philip IV, had the Pope Boniface VIII arrested. He died. His successor, Pope Benedict XI, lasted about a year in the job, and died. The conclave was deadlocked in their choice to elect a new Pope, so Philip IV rammed home a new Pope on the mall, Pope Clement V, who was, dare I say, elected in 1305. However, Clement refused to go to Rome. And so, in 1309, began the period known as the Babylonian Captivity, also known as the Avignon Papacy. The next seven popes were all French, and, not surprising, they were all heavily influenced by the French crown. So, when a noble family named de Blois wanted Guy de Pentier to marry Marie de Blois, the family got Pope John XXII to sign the annulment. No doubt with a little help, seeing as how Marie de Blois was King Philip VI's niece. Anyway, on to point of interest number two. King Edward III of England inherited the Duchy of Aquitaine, and as the Duke of Aquitaine, he was a vassal to his cousin, Philip VI of France. Yes. This meant the King of England was also a French Duke, which made him subject to the French King. Don't worry, it gets more confusing. Down! Down on the ground! Get down! That hostage is going to slow the cops down! Philip, the King of France, made an alliance with the King of Scotland. This didn't sit well with Edward. Then, a man named Robert d'Artois fled France to England. Philip demanded him back. Edward said no. So Philip confiscated Aquitaine. Edward's response? In 1337, Edward declared himself king of all of France, challenging Philip VI directly. Edward III was a grandson of Philip IV, so he just went ahead and said, I'm the big kahuna now, and by doing so, kicked off the Hundred Years' War. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Back to Jean-Louis. Happier days were coming. That's it. Downloading. Give it a moment. Get down on the ground. Down on the fucking ground. Down. That same year, in 1330, she married Olivier de Clisson IV, a wealthy widower. By all accounts, they had that rare marriage in a time where everything was arranged among the noble houses for alliances and so on. They fell in love. Now find a terminal in IT with internet access. Upload that data to me. Interesting side note, Guy de Pantier died under shady circumstances in 1331 before he could marry Marie de Blois. Make of that what you will.
Now having taken the name Jeanne de Clisson, she and her new husband would eventually come to have five children together. Isabeau, Maurice, Olivia V, Guillaume, and Jean. So, remember how I said Brittany, or Bretagne, was an independent state? On April the 30th, 1341, the then current Duke of Brittany, John the Good, died without children. His half-brother, Jean de Montfort, laid claim to the duchy. But John had hated his guts and tried to give Brittany to Philip VI, King of France. This went against all manner of protocol, and the Breton nobles were completely against it. John's deceased brother, Guy, yes, that Guy, had a daughter named Jeanne de Pantier, who had married Marie de Blois' brother, Charles, in 1337, something which gave Charles a claim to the ducal title. Refreshing those family ties, Charles de Blois was a nephew of King Philip VI. So at this point, with the aforementioned heat between Philip VI and Edward III, the King of France backed his nephew, Charles de Blois, and the King of England naturally backed Jean de Montfort. After all, Brittany was a nice defensible position between the kingdoms of England and France. This whole proxy war situation was called the War of the Breton Succession. Olivier de Clisson sided with the French and supported Charles de Blois. The year after, in 1342, Charles de Blois took the town of Vannes. Later in the year, a counter-attack was mounted by Robert d'Artois, the Frenchman who ran off to England earlier in our story, reclaiming Vannes for de Montfort. Olivier de Clisson, who was in charge of the defense of Vannes, was absent when it was captured. He raised an army of over 12,000 men to retake it. In the assault, Robert Artois was mortally wounded. He was taken to England, where he died of his injuries. As a direct result of this, King Edward took it upon himself to go to Brittany and lay siege to the towns of Nantes, Rennes and Vannes. The fourth siege of Vannes began on December 5th, 1342. Olivier de Clisson was taken prisoner. Philip VI, meanwhile, assembled an army of 50,000 men, led by his own son. However, before the two armies could meet on any field of battle, Pope Clement VI intervened, and a three-year truce was signed. This would be the Truce of Malestois. Nobody runs away. A professional doesn't need to kill those people. Let me you check. Know? Room, uh... Nobody runs away if they're cable tied. You understand? Don't forget, they got that CCTV, remember? 
Hostages and prisoners were exchanged and ransomed free. Edward and his men departed for England. Olivier and Jean-Louis were reunited, but their happiness would be short-lived. Due to the low, low price of securing Olivier's release, Charles de Blois and King Philip VI became suspicious that Olivier was in league with King Edward. And so, in 1343, Olivier was invited to a tournament, ostensibly to celebrate the truce. Upon arriving at this tournament, the Blois forces arrested him, and he was tried for treason. Olivier de Clisson was executed for treason in Paris on August 2nd, 1343. His body was placed in a gibbet and put on display. His head was sent to Brittany, to the town of Nantes, where it was put on a pike above the Sauveteau Gate. So, Farrell, I hear you say. This French noble's intrigue in war with England shit is interesting and all, you know, very George R. R. Martin, but uh, what the hell does any of it have to do with pirates? I'm getting to that. Jean de Clisson took her two young sons, Olivia V and Guillaume, at the time seven and five years old, to Nantes, where they saw their father's head on a pike. And Jean Louis swore bloody vengeance on Charles de Blois and King Philip VI. She sold off all of the extensive de Clisson estates and belongings and raised a small army. Then she started attacking the pro French troops in Brittany. And let me tell you, Jean-Louis did not mess around. She was a woman scorned. At Tufu, she gained entry to the castle by appearing as Olivier's grieving widow. When the gates opened, her men sprang forth from cover, and she had everyone inside put to the sword. Everyone but one survivor to run along and tell the tale. How's that for starting a trend? Jean de Clisson ravaged the French countryside, rallying every nobleman wronged or spited by Philip VI. It didn't take long for her to be branded a traitor. She didn't care. Eventually, her situation became untenable. Hunted by the King of France, and with nowhere else to go, she purchased herself a ship and took to the seas. Watch out, it's a god. Now, this being the mid fourteenth century, cannons and naval artillery were yet to become common. Naval warfare at this time was still just hooking onto another ship falling in close and boarding it with swords and axes. In other words, brutal close combat. Jean made piracy her business, raiding towns up and down the French coast and attacking allies of de Blois and King Philip, murdering loyal noblemen and putting entire townships to the torch, always leaving one survivor to speak of the horrors they had witnessed. By 1345, 
Jean had disrupted French trading routes to such an extent the French merchant vessels were afraid to sail the English Channel. Philip VI sent a fleet of ships to take the pirate out for good. Jean de Clisson, her sons Olivia V, Guillaume, and her daughter Jeanne, escaped the onslaught in a skiff. For five days, she rowed the tiny boat away from the battle. After five days, they were rescued. On the journey, her youngest son, Guillaume, perished due to exposure. He was seven. In England, Jeanne met with King Edward. He was so impressed by her exploits, he outfitted her with new ships and crews. She painted her ships black, dyed the sails red, and ventured out to begin committing high seas piracy. Her flagship she named My Revenge. This time her children stayed in England. In 1346, at the Battle of Cressy, the one that made the English longbow famous, Jeanne and her ships supplied the English forces. The Battle of Cressy is remembered for being a major English victory and a massive blow towards the French. For the next ten years, Jean de Clisson would continue to ply the English Channel, scouring it of French ships. According to some sources, she personally decapitated all French nobles and other high-value targets they came across with an axe before throwing the bodies in the ocean. As usual, they would send a few witnesses home alive to spread the stories. In 1347, with the arrival of the Black Death, the bubonic plague wiped out a third of Europe's population. In 1350, Philip VI of France died. Neither of these two events slowed Jean down. She had now acquired a nickname, the Lioness of Brittany. In 1356, after murdering the French for 13 years, Jean de Clisson retired. She married Sir Walter Bentley, one of King Edward's lieutenants. She eventually settled at the castle of Ennebon in Brittany, a port town in the Montfort control. Jean-Louis passed away in 1359. Married at 12, mother at 14, lived through the Great Famine, widowed, 
terrible second marriage, found true love, mother to seven children, widowed again, became a vicious and feared pirate, and brought her children along for it, lived through the Black Death, and retired and remarried at the end of it all. As an epilogue, on the 29th of September, 1365, Olivia de Clisson V, alongside John of Montfort IV, son of Jean de Montfort, faced the army of Charles de Blois outside the town of Array. Charles de Blois was killed in the fighting. Executed on your plan with ruthless efficiency, I am impressed. You will hear from me when I require your services again.